All right. Hi, folks. My name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and a member of this group. And we're in Bill's story on page 13 at pretty near the top of the page. So we're we're going through Bill's existence as an alcoholic from going from before he's an alcoholic, where he just had a couple of drinks to where he became an alcoholic, where he, he alcohol went beyond being a necessity and became his master. And when that happened, he knew he had to give up, but he didn't know how. He did step one in the process of still drinking and still getting sick from alcohol. A friend of his stopped by, Ebby Thatcher, and talked to him about a new religious idea and a program of action that he had learned from the Oxford group. Bill fought, fought it. He didn't really like the, the spiritual angle of the program and was very resistant, but Ebby kept on going. Ended up, Bill, you know, he admitted that he was defeated. And then Ebby Thatcher said to him when, when he said, I don't believe in a God that's personal to me. Ebby said, well, why don't you choose your own conception of God? And then Bill realized at that point that it's only a matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Nothing more was required for me to make my beginning. And so he decided to accept that religious idea that Ebby Thatcher had given him that was to believe in a power greater than himself. And so they ended up taking him back to the hospital for the third time, putting him in the hospital. That was around somewhere in November 1934. He had been, it's towards the end of that November, he got taken to the hospital. And Actually, it, he had been still drinking for a while, even after Abby had talked to him. And he went into the hospital and had his last drink, and that drink was on uh, December 11th, 1934. And that's when Bill got sober. He was still in the hospital, still under, um, still dealing with, you know, alcoholism. He was sick, very un under uh, nourished. He was in trouble, uh, but they got him sober and he started, you know, he started listening more to what Ebby Thatcher had to tell him. So we'll start off tonight on page 13, where we're going to see Bill. Remember, there was no 12 steps at this time. They, they had the teachings of the Oxford group, had a few tenants of the Oxford group that came into this. And he, the Oxford group had six steps that were very difficult. So Bill didn't really have anything to go, go on except what Ebby was telling him. And it took him several days, a couple of weeks before he started getting it. And uh, so he did steps one and two. And then it starts on the top of page 13, um, second full paragraph. It says, there I humbly offered myself to God as I then understood him, to do with me as he would. I placed myself unreservedly under his care and direction. I admitted for the first time that of myself I was nothing, that without him I was lost. So that part of the paragraph is all about step three, and that's what turned out to be our step three later on. And then he says, I ruthlessly faced my sins and became willing to have my newfound friend take them away, root and branch. I have not had a drink since. That was the beginning of step four. That was what he was doing with step four with Ebby Thatcher, talking about all the things that he had done bad, making his list, doing all that kind of stuff. And notice that the friend there is capitalized. So his newfound friend is a you know, he used friend as a new word for God. Bill wasn't real comfortable with God yet. So he called him his friend. And so with Ebby, he did step four there. And then next paragraph, it says, my schoolmate visited me and I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. That was step five. He did step five with uh, Ebby. And it says, we made a list of people I had hurt and toward whom I felt resentment. 
I express my entire willingness to approach these individuals, admitting my wrong. Never was I to be critical of them. I was to write all such matters to the utmost of my abilities. In those few little things, the part about step three, where he humbly offered himself to God unreservedly, one of the tenets of the Oxford group was surrender. But when Bill wrote this, he said, alcoholics aren't going to pay attention to surrender. They're not going to do surrender. So he changed it, and he didn't mention it as surrender. It was turning our will and our lives over to the care of God, meaning our thoughts and our actions. And so that was surrender. That was a little bit different. And that's still the one thing we do in AA today. The only thing that I even consider ritualistic about AA, anything that's like something that you have to do is surrender. That third step prayer, surrender, is critical. I've done it many times. And every time it brings me some kind of new understanding with my higher power, better understanding of my, of, of what I call God. And then in that later part of that paragraph, I expressed my entire willingness to approach these individuals, admitting my wrong, never was I to be critical of them, is steps eight and nine, where he took what he had in step four and carried those lists down and then went to see these people. And that was about another one of the tenets of the Oxford group was restitution. They believed, you know, you had to pay for any damages you did, whatever it cost anybody else. It wasn't good enough to say you're sorry or, oops, I was wrong. You had to pay restitution. If you ran over your car, it ran over with your car, the neighbor's fence, you couldn't say you're sorry. You ran over the fence. You had to buy the fence and fix the fence. You know, it's different than just, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to wreck your fence. That wasn't good enough. But Alcoholics would argue about restitution also. So uh, then it goes down. I was to test my thinking by the new God consciousness within. Common sense would thus become uncommon sense. That's what later turned into our step 10, is our recognition that as we did things during the day, we had to ask God to help us get over them. And we became God conscious. The next sentence. I was to sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. Never was I to pray for myself except as my request bore on my usefulness to others. Then and only then might I expect to receive, but that would be in great measure. That's step 11. The bill did his step 11 and realized that there was meditation involved. There was also prayer involved. Bill was, through these steps, having a psychic change. He was changing his mind. He was doing things differently. He was thinking about other people differently than he had ever thought of them before. And that's what the doctor had called a psychic change. And he was thinking about doing things the right way for the right reason, which became his moral psychology. His psychology changed to start doing things the right way, not the wrong way or not whatever way fit him, but the right way. And that was by depending on God in his meditation, his prayers. Then he, it goes on, my friend, and this time the friend is not capitalized, so he's actually talking about Eddie here. He says, my friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my creator, that I would have the elements of a way of living which answered all my problems, belief in a power of God plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were the essential requirements. So these were things that Bill had never considered before. So he had to have those three essentials, honesty, willingness, and humility in order to go forward. 
And then in 14, on page 14, the first full paragraph, it says, simple but not easy. A price had to be paid. It meant destruction of self-centeredness. I must turn in all things to the Father of light who presides over us all. So that's turn in all things, everything, complete, 100%. And this is the time when Bill tell, says something to alcoholics that we don't want to hear. We have to give up the two most important things to us. One is our alcohol, and the other is our ego, our self, our self-centeredness. We have to give those up and start thinking of other people. Stay sober and think of other people. That was a vast change in thinking, and we have to continue that. And then something really important happened to Bill, and it was a miracle. And the next paragraph talks about that. It says, these were revolutionary and drastic proposals, but the moment I fully accepted them, the effect was electric. There was a sense of victory followed by a, such a peace and serenity as I had never known. There was utter confidence. I felt lifted up as though a great clean wind of the mountaintop blew through and through. God comes to most men gradually, but his impact on me was sudden and profound. So something happened that day. You know, I wasn't there, you weren't there, but something happened that was spectacular, that was different. And that was Bill's spiritual experience. That was the moment he had that spiritual experience that changed everything. He had a new way of thinking after that. He had a new way of living after that. He had been moved profoundly better, you know, bigger than anything that had ever happened to him. Uh, and it was quite a, a shaky thing for those that have spiritual experiences. They're scary. They're scary when they happen. You don't know. You don't expect them. They're there. They're happening. I had one on a bus when I was coming to Fort Lauderdale, I thought I'd had a stroke or something. I was having audible and visual hallucinations. It scared me to death. And later on, I learned that was just um, a spiritual experience. I changed my, you know, a voice said, you know, you don't have to drink anymore. And I've never had a drink since then. And that was not my plan. That was not anything that I had ever thought about. Nothing. I, you know, I was planning on coming here to drink. And yet I got here and never had a drink. So it's a powerful thing. And it says, for a moment, I was alarmed. He called and called my friend, the doctor, and asked if I were still sane. He listened in wonder as I talked. So, I mean, he was so nervous about it. He was so upset about it. He didn't know what was happening. He called the doctor because he had overheard Lois and the doctor talking and said, he's going to go insane. He's going to have a wet brain. He's going he's to be in bad shape if he keeps drinking. You know, so he thought, well, hell has happened. I've gone insane. But it wasn't insanity. It was a great spiritual experience. And it says that it comes to some men gradually, but to me it was very uh, sudden and profound. And if you read Appendix 2 in the back of the book, it talks about these spiritual experiences being like these great white light experiences. But it also says that most cases are the educational variety, which is a gradual learning of how God works in our lives and how personal it is, uh, our relationship with God. And so it comes gradually in an educational variety. You know, that doesn't eliminate, if you're one of those persons that's getting an educational variety, spiritual experience, that doesn't eliminate you from the possibility of having a very big spiritual experience later on. So watch out for that. Finally, he shook his head and said, uh, his head saying, something has happened to you I don't understand, but you had better hang on to it. Anything is better than the way you were. The good doctor now sees many men who have such experience, experiences. He knows they are real. 
So the doctor accepts these big white light experiences, something that actually really happens. He's heard about too many of them when he's talking to Bill and he's talking to other alcoholics that have recovered that have had these same kind of experiences. They explain them the exact same way. And he knows they're real. So a doctor accepting the fact that there is spiritual experiences is something new in the world at that time. Doctors dealt with science. They didn't deal with spiritual things. So when you have a spiritual experience, to have a doctor admit that it, that's what it is and that he thinks they're real, it was quite a change. While I lay in the hospital, the thought came that there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who might be glad to have what had been so freely given me. Perhaps I could help some of them. They, in turn, might work with others. And that's the formula for step 12. That's when Bill's thinking really turned away. He was grateful for what had happened to him and now realized that this is something he could hand to other alcoholics. He says, um, my friend, Eb, my friend, and this is Ebby, he says, my friend had emphasized the absolute necessity of demonstrating these principles in all my affairs. Particularly, it was imperative to work with others as he had worked with me. Faith without works is dead, he said. And how appallingly true for the alcoholic. So there's the beginning of how step 12 falls together. Step 12 says we have to practice these principles in all our affairs. And there it is. That's what it says. And we have to carry the message to other alcoholics. And there it says that. So this is putting together. And it's right after him having a spiritual awakening. So in step 12, it says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry the message to alcoholics and practice these principles in all our affairs. So in those two or three paragraphs there, it's the real development of what is now our 12th step. And then it says, this is a great sentence. This is a sentence that you should remember forever. Mark it in your books. For if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. If he did not work, he would surely drink. And if he drank, he would surely die. Then faith would be dead indeed. With us, it is just like that. And so, Bill was trying hard to impress on us that being sober did not mean you're going to walk down a road paved in gold and have just beautiful everything all the time. As we go on living, we still have life on life's terms. We're going to have trials. We're going to have low spots. There's going to be rough times. But by depending and relying on our higher power, we'll get through them. And what we have to do to make that happen is to work with other alcoholics. Keep working with other alcoholics. Always try to carry the message. And sometimes you carry the message to another alcoholic just to keep yourself sober. That's a selfish part of the program, but it's real. You have to try to keep yourself sober by helping another alcoholic. And if you help him and he gets sober, that's a great benefit. So it goes on to say, my wife and I abandoned ourselves with enthusiasm to the idea of helping other alcoholics to the solution of their problems. And it's all of their problems, no matter what problem, not just the alcohol problem, but problems in their home, problems at work, problems at play, in their community. All their problems can be fixed by this, not just their drinking problem. It was fortunate for my old business associates remained skeptical for a year and a half, during which I found little work. I was not too well at the time and was plagued by waves of self-pity and resentment. This sometimes nearly drove me to drink, 
But I soon found that when all other measures failed, work with another alcoholic would save the day. Many times I have gone to my old hospital in despair. On talking with a man there, I would be amazingly lifted up and set on my feet. It is a design for living that works in rough going. So now that Bill's sober, and Bill's working hard at trying to stay sober, and he's trying to carry the message, he still has a year and a half of time when he's first getting sober that the road is not paved with gold. He's, he has bouts with self-pity, resentment, and Bill suffered from depression. So that just makes everything worse. So he was having his trials and low spots right after he got sober at a time that it, it could have made him drink, but he stuck with the program and he did what he needed to do. And if he was feeling in risk of drinking, he went to the hospital, tried to find another alcoholic he could talk to. And when he talked to that guy, he got lifted up and that healed his other problems. That healed his resentments and his self-pity and his depression by helping another alcoholic. So it's important. It's important for our whole welfare of our whole lives, including staying sober, but being happy, joyous, and free is to carry the message to other alcoholics. It's a suggestion, but it's really a necessity. You know, if you want to stay sober for long periods of time, help others. So it says, we commenced to make many fast friends, and a fellowship has grown up among us, of which is a wonderful thing to feel a part. So he had the message, he had his, his program of action, but then he found a fellowship. He created a fellowship. He became part of a fellowship. And that fellowship exists today in millions, for millions of alcoholics all around the world. And that fellowship is a key to helping us stay sober. These meetings, the, the camaraderie amongst uh, alcoholics in recovery is a giant part of us all staying sober. It puts us in a position where we can help others and receive help if need be. So the fellowship is critical. The book is critical. The book has all the instructions on how to do this program of action. Okay, so the book is critical. But the fellowship is too. While it is possible to get sober and stay sober with just the book, you'll be missing out on so much more. So the fellowship is how to go. It says the joy of living we really have. Even under pressure and difficulty, I have seen hundreds of families set on their feet in the path that really goes somewhere have seen the most impossible domestic situations righted, huge and bitterness of all sorts wiped out. I have seen men come out of asylums and resume a vital place in the lives of their families and communities. Business and professional men have regained their standing. There is scarcely any form of trouble and misery which has not been overcome among us. In one western city and its environs, there are uh, 1,000 of us and our families. We meet frequently so that newcomers may find the fellowship they seek. At these informed gatherings, one may often see from 50 to 200 persons. We are growing in numbers and power. An alcoholic in his cups is an unlovely creature. Our struggles with them are variously strenuous, comic, and tragic. One poor chap committed suicide in my home. He could not or would not see our way of life. There is, however, a vast amount of fun about it all. I suppose some would be shocked at our seemingly worldliness and levity, but just underneath there is a deadly earnestness. Faith has to work 24 hours a day in and through us, or we perish. Most of us feel we need look no further for utopia. We have it with us right here and now. Each day, my friend's simple talk at our kitchen 
multiplies itself in a widening circle of peace on earth and goodwill to men. And at my printing of the big book in 2015, we had 115,358 groups in the world. That's in 54 countries or something like that, a whole lot of countries. So this little talk at a kitchen table that managed to get a hopeless and helpless Bill Wilson sober has now spread completely around the world with millions of people. It's quite an amazing journey. And if you look at that last paragraph, look at all the things that were fixed. It's not talking just, the last paragraph on page 15, it's not talking just about alcohol. He's talking about feuds and bitterness, um, domestic situations, businessmen back into the business, back in their professional life, and no form of trouble or misery that cannot be solved by this program and this fellowship. So it's really amazing, important it is, that this stuff happens, that we continue with the fellowship. The fellowship cannot be ignored as a part of the program. Neither can this book, and neither can AA as a whole. Bill says you have to give everything to God, everything. Hold back nothing. Over and over in the book, which we'll read in the next few chapters, everything in the book talks about the totality of how much we involve ourselves in the program. We've got to do service work so it keeps going. We've got to help other alcoholics. We've got to do our own part by practicing the principles in all our affairs, carry the message. We have to do all of that to keep this alive and to help other people. And in doing so, we will keep ourselves sober. So that's a great story of Bill Wilson here. Next week, we will start with chapter two. <clears throat> there is a solution. An interesting thing about this chapter is Bill's story and there's a solution were put together as a little booklet. Those two chapters alone, bound, put together, and they were distributed before the book was printed, before the book was finished, distributed in a way of getting part of the message out, showing an example of what the book was going to be about to help raise money to publish the book and get the book published and get it out and get it circulated. So, it's, and it's, as you'll see when we read it, one half of the chapter tells a little bit about alcoholism and points us towards chapter three, more about alcoholism. And the later part of the paragraph points us towards the solution for the person who may be agnostic and about the spiritual side of the program. So it's a, a two-prong followed by the next two chapters after that. So it's a very interesting read, and you'll love it, I'm sure. Thank you, and back to you, Steve.